complex, the Bible is complex. Human existence is a tangled ball of experience, perception, and understanding. Ravel is a puzzling word, denoting both a tangling and untangling. This podcast attempts to hold honest conversations in good faith. Some ideas expressed in this podcast will be challenging. Others will be obvious. When a PhD in biblical interpretation and a habitually podcasting man-child discuss matters of society, scripture, and scandal, you get Ravel. Hey everybody, you are listening to Ravel, and it's me, your best buddy Basil. And with me, as always, the nurturing, the elegant, the more valuable than rubies, you know him, you love him, Dr. Christopher Ryan Gates. What's up, buddy? Hello. How are you Hi. doing? Hi. Wow. Did I did I surprise you? Yeah, I feel yeah. like such a woman. <laughs> <laughs> a matriarch, Chris. Yeah. A matriarch. Yeah. And it's only fair. It's only fair because, of course, we hope everybody enjoyed our previous episode on patriarchy. Uh, if you didn't listen to it, you can later. Don't worry. You don't need to have listened to that one to listen to this one it's not an episodical and there's will be no spoilers well there might be spoilers but they'll be sort of delightful um but indeed today chris you are not a matriarch but you are perhaps married to one yeah um yes Yes, so we started the episode about patriarchy, um, kind of defining terms, which is something that uh, I think is helpful to do when you have any kind of discussion about, you know, big ideas, is to make sure that everyone's kind of understanding them in the in the same way. And when we were talking about patriarchy, we were talking about sort of the idea of male headship, um, and you know what the what the Bible teaches us about that. But then we also talked about how you know, society has come to understand that word today and where there might be a difference between those two things. Um, but we talked about patriarchy, so we figured, yeah, let's do one on, on matriarchy too. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, not to spoil, but there was a point <laughs> at one point last episode on patriarchy where we sort of discovered that, uh, you know, biblical patriarchy is almost synonymous with like male servitude uh, rather than the sort of, you know, colloquial modern idea of patriarchy, which is sort of, uh, you know, male domineering, male domination. And yeah. I think that there's some interesting little twists and turns, which uh, is laying in wait for us in this episode as well. Yeah. So... Yeah, biblical leadership is it's servant leadership. So when you talk about a person being in a position of leadership, and if you're talking about male headship in the family and in the church, then the, then the male is in a position of leadership, then that automatically is going to make him the servant. It's going to make him the one who is doing the serving. So yeah, the idea that leadership means you're the boss and you tell everybody what to do, you stand there and oversee everybody else while they're working is is completely erroneous. That's nowhere it's in the Bible. part of the fall, man. Yeah. We got to get back to the garden. Yeah. So, yeah, and that would kind of be more the idea when we're talking about uh, matriarchy, sort of sort of what we're talking about. It could be understood in the sense where there is a woman, kind of like uh, the queen, um, you know, like we may even understand, um, you know, Queen Elizabeth being like the one who's kind of whatever, even though in the UK, <laughs> the, the uh, royal family is really more of just kind of like a, you know, cultural sort of icon than they actually do anything to, to rule and reign anymore. But in the past, you know, a matriarch may have been a ruler who was a female, but there's also the idea that a matriarch is just the counterpart of a patriarch. So if you have a, a man who, you know, has a, a family and he is kind of the head of his family, then his wife, uh, who would be serving, you know, alongside of him and with him um, in overseeing the family could be considered to be um, the matriarch of the family. So the idea that we're going to be talking about uh, today 
um, when we're talking about matriarchy is really kind of, you know, boils down to this idea of like biblical womanhood and what is kind of the Bible teach us about what it means to be a woman and, you know, the roles, responsibilities for women. And then, of course, we will look at how, you know, society has come to view women and maybe even talk about a little feminism um, and those sorts of things and uh, get some ideas there. So where should we start with all of well, this? Well, and this think? is what I love about doing this show with you, Chris, um, is, you know, I've basically built an entire career on uh, jumping into topics and uh, speaking about things that I'm entirely unqualified to speak about. <laughs> and if there's anything <laughs> that I feel unqualified to sort of speak on or about, it is just, you know, the concept of womanhood. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I think, uh, I think we'll, we'll be okay. We've spent some time. And, of course, it wouldn't be an episode of Ravel without uh, – you know, an explicit understanding that we could be entirely wrong about everything. Yeah, yeah. So, um, first of all, of course, the both of us being males, uh, that puts us at something of a disadvantage to talk so about. So lame, boring. <laughs> to talk about the other, you know, half of the human species. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, on top of that, the old trope, you know, which some people may consider to be offensive or even misogynistic or something but you know uh people you know talk about all the time it's it's very difficult to understand uh you know the mind of a woman and how she operates you know and and there's a lot of complexity there's a uh teacher um and he does kind of like marriage conferences and he tries to be real funny about it um his name is mark gunger um, and probably if people have run around in the in the church for too long, they've likely seen some of his uh, bits. He's he's almost like a stand up comedian who's doing like marriage teaching in, in the middle. And he talks about the fact that it's kind of like the, uh, you know, men are from Mars, women are for Venus sort of sort of idea. But he talks about the, the brains and he says that men's brains are kind of like waffles where they have these compartments you know you have these little squares and you deal with one thing at a time you know you kind of compartmentalize things and you're have men generally tend to have this ability to kind of focus on one thing at a time and save the thing that's coming you know in two hours for two hours from now when i have to deal with that and then he talks about the fact that men's brains like waffles women's brains like spaghetti, uh, he says, and each that different is topic, not where I thought you were going with that. <laughs> each different topic is a, you know, noodle of spaghetti. And the idea is that they all, uh, connect in, in overlap and kind of in, you know, touch each other. So the, the point that he's trying to make, he actually is saying it in sort of a favorable sense towards women is that their brains are like these supercomputers that are able to process all of these different things all at the same time. So you can't talk about, you know, your plans for next week without thinking about how that's going to affect whatever the kids and this other thing over here and family mm. issues and finances and all these things that all of these things get wrapped all together. And a woman is thinking about all of them at the same time, whereas a man is kind of thinking about things one at a time. And it is a generalization but it lends yeah. itself to that idea that sometimes it, it seems difficult for men uh to try to grasp at you know the complexity of a woman mm -hmm. yeah well and another wonderful thing i love about doing this show with you chris is that as good millennials should um never pass up an opportunity to uh, reflect on some sort of Potentially problematic, nostalgic uh, remnant of our Christian past um, <laughs> and present. So, yes, I don't know that fella by name, but certainly uh, I have been sort of, I don't know, influenced by his, uh, I don't know, influence, influenced by his influence within... <laughs> The sort of '90s, early 2000s church. I don't even know what the what his time frame is, but that's uh, he what was it feels just like actually right here in town within like the last five years. He's current. I think. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, what do I even know, man? It's pretty interesting. Although I watched some of it with uh, with my wife, and she thought it was she didn't she didn't appreciate it too much. She thought she was like, "This is not this is not very kind," well, because you he know, does this. I voice. was <laughs> I was gonna say I want to hear about his voice in a second, but just. F- just because I will never pass up a moment to try to endear myself to your wife um, and gain her approval at all odds, against all odds, rather. Uh, I I guess that was sort of the, the root of my comments just now, the potentially problematic part, because I do cringe a little bit at the idea of... Uh, uh, just the the general concept of like women are like this, men are like this. Ha ha! Women are like this, men they're like this, and especially <laughs> using it in some sort of comedic fashion, it feels it feels cheap, man. It just feels cheap. Yeah. Now tell me about his funny voice. Well, he just does this voice for his, you know, wife, either his wife or for like all women. It's just this kind of shrill, you know, like mm. high pitched, like kind of, you know, it's not very favorable. Uh, so mm-hmm. it is a little bit, you know, it, it's it's it, it could be taken uh, disrespectfully, or you could even go as far as to say misogynistic or whatever. But it's there. You have to be able to sometimes, and I'm not saying in this particular instance with Mark Gunger and his and his thing, but when it comes to like even stand up comedy, I mean, you something that's going to come up in every stand up comedy routine, whether it's a male comedian or a female comedian, is they are going to talk about the differences between men and women, and they find these really funny points to bring up and in, in these ways to talk about them that just become. I mean, it's it's like I mean, you almost have to do it. I mean, every stand up comedian is talking about his wife or his girlfriend or you know her husband or or boyfriend, and there is there are these differences, and that's one of the beautiful things about the way that God has created uh, humanity, and in the creation order tells us in Genesis that He created mankind in His image, man. And woman, male and female, he created them. Both of them being in his image, yet being uh, distinct, um, being unique, and being, you know, uh, complementary to each other, that they are not the same, they are not... Uh, they are the same in value. Again, we're not gonna we're not gonna say one is more valuable or more important than the other. We're not saying that. Uh, but what we are saying is that they are unique, um, kind of in in their relationship to each other, in their relationship to the world around them, in society, and all of those different things. So it brings up, you know, this sort of idea of gender roles. And while this is becoming almost a Gasp. taboo, yeah, almost a taboo. Uh, thing to talk about anymore it is something that uh, it's just really difficult to escape and I was I have been thinking about this um, you know for the past seven months or so here as uh, you know we are expecting a child and it's just very interesting that we'll be laying there at the end of the day you know getting ready to go to bed and you know uh, my wife she just knows the patterns and the routines already of our, you know, our unborn son, Simon, that, you know, she just knows when he's going to be moving. He seems to know when she's going to be moving, when she's going to be up. And they already have this relationship with each other <laughs> that, like, I'm on the outside of, you know. And she has to tell me, here, here, feel this, you know, and, and, and listen. Oh, and earlier today he was doing this. And she's already telling me, you know, it's it's like... He's already been born, and I'm out to work, and, and I come home, and she's been with him all day, and oh, today he did this, and today he did this, and there's, like, even if I was with her all day long, I can't I can't have these experiences that she's having, so th- this is one of the areas where we see this very clear distinction in roles between men and women, and it lends itself to this kind of maternal, uh, nurturing sort of... Uh, quality that women are going to have that not that men don't have it but a man is never going to have that same sort of connection that a woman has with her child where you know she essentially has uh, you know somewhere around nine months extra extra time getting to know 
our child than than I do. So it's just that that's one, you know, example to point to to say that there are these differences. And and because she's had that extra time, that's going to she is going to naturally be more inclined to continue um, you know, in that relationship that she's already had. And this is where, you know, even after the baby is born, the, the mothers are the ones who feed the baby. They're the ones who, you know, <laughs> spend a lot of time, probably more time. Baby's already very familiar with her voice, very familiar with her routines, those sorts of things. It just lends itself to the woman being this kind of nurturer and this caretaker and this, you know, motherly sort of individual who is more apt, much more apt to be the one to tend to and take care of the children. Not because that's any kind of a lesser, less important, uh, less valuable by any means. Nobody would say that it's extremely important and extremely valuable, almost more important than going out and being a breadwinner is being the one who's who's rearing, rearing the child. So not any kind of saying anything demeaning or or putting any woman in any kind of any kind of lesser place but it just is a further example uh, about these gender roles and in the fact that women have special responsibilities within the family and men have other certain responsibilities within the family and it falls to the woman to you know, gestate the child, to give birth to the child, to nurture and feed the child, and mm-hmm. it ends up being that that's kind of, you know, the role that she that she has just by default. So I see you too are attempting to uh, endear yourself to your wife against all <laughs> odds here on the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, whatever it takes. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you for that rundown of uh, the birds and the bees there. And we're good. So we can, we've got that straight. We know where babies come from and uh, the benefits that come along with that. Um, so we, part of our sort of pre-conversations um, before the show, uh, which affected my research, my my Google searches <laughs> in regards to, you know, trying to prepare myself to talk about um, this topic, matriarchy, was that there was like some interesting distinctions that I was f- having to like find myself or I was finding myself having to make um, because, you know, matriarchy, uh, sort of female leadership in the forms that that takes. Um, especially in the Bible, but also just in sort of theological uh, dialogue, uh, can very easily sort of wiggle into like feminism territory and wiggle into uh, all sorts of different gender roles, I guess, which you already mentioned. So I don't think we can avoid um, talking about matriarchy, the Bible, society, gender, these types of things without sort of blurring these lines a little bit. I found myself like really wanting to to find hard borders between like the topic of matriarchy and the topic of feminism, whether we're talking about sort of like a biblical feminism or a, a contemporary sort of social uh, feminism and et cetera, et cetera. So just to just to kind of lay out the map for everybody here, there's going to be a little bit of wiggling in and out of all of that, um, which I guess we did do a bit in, in the patriarchy episode. The difference being, um, Oh dang. What what was the female version of, uh, promise keepers? Uh, women of faith. It was, was it that? I think that's what it was called. Yeah. Wow. The PR people put a lot less energy into that one, huh? (laughs) Women and faith, that's maybe. the patriarchy, folks. Yeah, Ugh. I thought it had a different name. I mean, there may be a, there may be a different one, but I know that my mother um, and my sister they did the women of faith thing, and all the ladies mm. from our church actually it was a big old big old deal. They all loved going, and okay. they'd well, come good. back crying and telling telling me stories about all of these wonderful you know experiences they had and. I don't know, Kathy Tricoli or something like that that's saying okay. there, whatever. Different. I think it was Women of Faith. Almost yeah. certain. 
So <laughs> I can always count on you to help me also sort of muddle through uh, the old memories of growing up as a Christian in America. Yeah. Um, okay, so do, what, do you have anything to say about the sort of the distinctions, or did you did you already make yourself known there in your def definition of terms? Well, between like uh, I'm still reeling from just learning where babies come from. So yeah. I gotta there's, remember. Actually, we were doing these birthing classes, and there's this really interesting video I could send Here you. Here we go. Uh, if you <laughs> <laughs> had no idea. I was a paramedic, actually, in my in my former life, so um, I have, uh, you know, assisted in the delivery of a couple babies already. It is... Uh, As a paramedic? Yeah. Emergency on-site baby delivery? Well, you have to do it. They give you clinical rounds, so you actually just oh. go schedule. You wait in the OB. But I, we had, we had one uh, patient in the field. Um, but we just, you just tell the tell the driver to drive really fast when you have a woman about to have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> just drive faster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they okay. they joked that... about it in paramedic school. The treatment for a pregnant woman is <laughs> acceleration. <laughs> drive fast. Get That's her to hilarious. the hospital as soon as you can. You do not want to have a baby in the back of the truck. Um, One of these days, we're going to need to get a full rundown of your previous life because new things pop up all the time, and it's very fun. Yeah. But yeah. don't get distracted. No. Uh, so... I, yeah, so, you know, matriarchy, I'm looking at it as, as for me personally, and again, this is how I'm understanding it, it is the, you know, responsibilities in the role of the woman in a home who is that counterpart to the patriarch. Again, not the servant, not the lesser than, but the partner to the patriarch to the man who you know leads the family the matriarch is the one who is right there beside him leading along with him so that's what i'm thinking of when i think of matriarchy when you're talking about feminism there are you know you could i guess go different kinds a sliding scale yeah and you could yeah. go all the way you know as far to one side of it to the most extreme where we we're getting back to talking about that kind of uh cult of Artemis back there in Ephesus and the fact that there are these women who say that they have no need for men, that men are scum, that all men are terrible, that you need to break free of, you know, any kind of influence of men in your life whatsoever. And that sort of idea of feminism and this sort of radical, you know, sort of idea. But then there is which, the more... Which, if I may, um, as far as like contemporary feminism the kind you just expressed is sort of an old school version of feminism yeah i'm not going to claim to know the ins and outs of first wave and second wave and third wave and things like that but as i understand it you know there may be some out there as you described the these sort of temple prostitutes of ephesus uh not you know rejecting the idea of men in general I feel like there there can sometimes be a, a, a just sort of like an, an immediate um, initiation of some programming, some sort of like uh, cultural programming that some people may feel uh, that they s sort of connect that directly with feminism, um, which was a version of it which still lingers, but uh, is not necessarily what a modern feminist might, uh, you know, consider the, the way to be. Yeah. Um, and you, again, as we talked about in the last episode, you're going to hear me at least do a little bit of tiptoeing around, um, mainly because it's not, this is not a topic that I'm qualified in any way to uh, talk with any authority on, but also... Um, I really feel that there is uh, a, a tendency, especially in sort of closed systems like a ch like the church and those who maybe don't like interact a whole lot outside of the church, um, to not necessarily have the correct uh, version of what they might be thinking about, like feminism. We might still, you know, somebody might still in their mind be referring to, you know, bra burning and uh, a menless society, things like that, uh, which is kind of uh, an, an unfair characterization 
of what modern feminists or those who claim to be that um, sort of hold to. So honestly, I'm just trying to be fair and intellectually honest. Um, and so when we talk about feminism in sort of these tropey ways of the past, uh, you kind of can veer off into just some like intellectual dishonesty or something akin to that. Yeah. So anyways, there's, there's the disclaimer for why I'm, and it's not even that I'm tiptoeing around trying to not offend somebody. I just want to be very specific and also accurate in, in the uh, characterizations of social movements like that um, because not striving for accuracy and setting up straw men uh, for social movements uh, does nothing to help uh, anybody, including ourselves. Um, it's much more beneficial to those of us on this side of things um, to steel man the arguments yeah. on the other side, which is try to represent uh, the most accurate and plausible version of something you d don't know about yeah yeah um and i would i mean i would i would put myself essentially right next to you and all that you just described there i too while there may be some things that i am considered an expert at these days by my credentials uh feminism is not one of them so <laughs> this is um an exploration you know uh by the two of us and and we are kind of just talking through this and just to just to you know, give do our due diligence here, and as you said, we did we did an episode about patriarchy, so let's you know talk about do uh, it. femininity um, as well, mm -hmm. and kind of you know I can talk about it from a biblical angle, but as far as you know, it's the modern kind of social movement that we see, or even you know within the last fifty years or so. Um, y y certainly not an expert. Um, I know about as much as anyone else knows, but as I have come to understand it, you have, you have the one, you know, far extreme. You even have just recently here within the last few years, you know, the feminist sort of movement that was going on and you had these women with, you know, little pink knit hats with female, you know, genitalia, uh, being an expression of it or whatever, you know, and those mm -hmm. sorts of things are out there and people might see those and think oh, yeah. about very, those. Very strong movement. It's just that the ideologies are different than they used to be. For but, sure. But I also will say this, if anybody out there knows someone who is in, you know, who, who, who is credentialed or, uh, you know, is some sort of much more learned person uh, in the in the ways of feminism. Uh, of course, we would be specifically interested in somebody who would like to talk about it in the context of, you know, Christianity or at least society, scripture, and scandal um, who might be a good fit. You should let us know. Send us an email. I would actually be very interested in that. And you know how we are programmed for the for the the societal patriarchy Chris is, um, uh -huh. I don't think we haven't had a female guest yet. So there uh, you go. It is true. Um, we, must, we must make it right to get the points. But this is kind of lends itself to what I think is a more honest um, definition of feminism, which when I think about it, I think the central point that kind of connects all of the you know various forms that you might see and on the sliding scale anywhere on that scale i think one of the the central points is this certain amount of uh feeling like there needs to be some kind of justice for uh womankind womanhood throughout all of history where um, women have been exploited, where they have been objectified, where they continue to be uh, marginalized, where they continue to be, you know, kind of typecast, and those those sorts of things kind of pigeonholed. And I think that the what is at the core of the feminist sort of movement is breaking out of these kind of confines that have been placed on females um, through kind of social structures and that is something that i am a proponent of i think that we need to um, understand femininity and we need to understand womanhood through the lens of scripture through the perspective of the bible and we need to look at women understand women 
uh, know them, their roles, their value, all of that stuff, the same way that God does. And I don't think that the way that God views women is the same way that society does. So in that sense, and this is kind of something that we talked about when we were talking about patriarchy uh, in the last episode, when we're talking about male headship, that it actually is the man's responsibility to make sure that his wife is being seen, that she is being heard, that her needs are being met, that she is, you know, walking in the fullness of her calling, whatever that might be. Um, And he is, should be, stewarding her in all of those things and giving her every opportunity, not having her to be continually under his thumb. And as we were talking also, kind of, we just kind of touched the surface in the last episode about gender roles and the fact that men generally are more career oriented. Men generally are more driven by what they do. um, And that is kind of at the center of what a man is, is what he does. And that's generally when men are meeting, it's, that's the first question that you ask a man is like, what do you do? What's your job? And that will tell me, you know, what you're about. On the other hand, and again, a generality, but women generally find their purpose and find their fulfillment in their relationships, in their families, even in their friendships, those sorts of things. And because of that distinction, you have men being more often than not career oriented, rising to the tops of all of these different organizations and things like that being in these places of power, and even if that is sort of a God-given prescription that men are, you know, in these positions of leadership, that does not mean that they are going to govern their leadership appropriately, that they will not be good stewards of their, uh, or doesn't mean that they will be good stewards of that leadership, and they start to, that power, as they say, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and they start, you know, mistreating the people who are supposed to be in their care rather than looking after them. And women in those instances tend to be marginalized and they tend to be looked at. It's kind of a, you know, it's kind of absurd, but if you have seen, you know, the movie Anchorman, um, they have, you know, this female news anchor comes in back in the 70s or whatever, and apparently that had had not been a thing in that time. I don't know. I wasn't alive in the 70s. I don't know how many female news anchors there are. Seems like there's more of them today than than not, but it, it became this, you know, just like a joke with all the guys, like, oh, who's this woman? She thinks she can come in here saying all kinds of sexist and misogynistic sorts of things, and while it seemed like it was a little bit over the top, and they kind of, you you know, made light of it in a lot of ways. Um, I don't think that that's too far from the reality that lots of women have experienced throughout the course of their lives where uh, there have been, you know, these men in positions of power and things like that who have just looked at them as something to be, uh, you know, a commodity to be had or, or something to be used for uh, their own purposes, whatever that might be. And somebody did not be taken seriously, not take their thoughts seriously. Um, and all of that, I think, is is real and really has affected a lot of women throughout the course of history. And I think that that is kind of what spawned the feminist movement is like, hey, listen, we're, we're people. We're smart. We're intelligent. We are capable. You know, we can we can do lots more things than you're giving us credit for. And you have put us all resigned us all to this stay at home mom sort of thing. And yeah, but perhaps some of us want to do that. And perhaps some of us don't. And that's, you know, the this is not you can't just lump us all into this category and yeah uh, the, the choice being a big part of it <laughs> it yeah, seems like exactly you know, yes we all want to have a choice in what our lives are like and it feels like maybe in general that was not always the case yeah so all that being said i i am there you know i i them for the feminist movement if it is about uh women being treated fairly and appropriately uh in all walks of life then yes i mean when it starts to to move uh, you know a little bit beyond that into some of these more extreme forms then you know i'm going to say well this is certainly not uh, i'm certainly going to have to disagree with those sorts of feminists but as it is you know just a cry to treat us with dignity and respect and fairness, then I say, yes, I'm, I stand alongside of you, and I say that that should be the case. Okay. Uh, well, we agree on that. That's great. Now, one thing I'm interested in sort of um, exploring is the difference between the perceived, uh, the perception of women 
and matriarchs in the Bible or the or the or the description or the expectation rather of women, because um, of course you know the feminist movement has had lots of critiques of Christianity and religion in general, um, and you know when I hear a lot of that, a lot of it really doesn't resonate with my experience again as a man in in the church um and maybe you know i had a different experience than a majority of people and i have no idea what it's like to be a woman uh in christianity or in the church but when it comes to like the biblical um sources that i personally was sort of taught about women it does not match up almost whatsoever with how somebody on the outside of the church would, you know, might describe, um, you know, how Christians see feminism, fe like the, the feminine, I guess, rather. Um, and, you know, of course, we've got the famous uh, section in the Bible, in Proverbs, that really... I think described my mother and most of the women in my life and was kind of the the basis of of how I uh I guess expected women to be um but also was was taught to you know feel about women or uh you know uh, uh, uh recognize a virtuous woman, Chris, <laughs> and you know I'm talking about Proverbs 31. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, churchy folk, you may know this part, but I'm, I'm going to read some of it because I think we can see some very stark differences in how the feminine will be described uh, by someone outside the church looking in and what is actually in the Bible. Uh, this I'm starting at verse 10 here in uh, Proverbs 31. And it goes like this. Will I start? Should I do the King James? Uh, I, if King you're there. James, is that too much? I got the King James and I got the, what do I got up here? The NIV. I mean, I'm, I go I'm, ESV? An, I'm an NIV guy myself, but, uh, mm. you know, you got to go. You got to go with your, whatever your heart language the is one, there. The one big difference in the NIV is that it specifically says wife instead of woman. Mm -hmm. And and when I, whenever I think of this or I think when it's, you know, been presented in the past to me, it was specifically woman and not wife. Um but I'll I'll read this. Uh I'll we'll, we'll do the NIV. Oh, but the King James is so fun. I'm going King James, baby. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Okay, we're a little male-centric here, Proverbs. But wait! She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. There we go. We got a working woman, Chris. Mm -hmm. yes. She is like... She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So she's a provider. Okay. She considereth a field and buyeth it. Consider the field, Chris, and buyeth it. <laughs> With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. Okay. So we got an, an entrepreneur and a, and a farmer. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengthens her arms. Strengthens her arms, Chris. <laughs> doing She's those doing curls. curls. Yeah. <laughs> She's uh, not forgetting the, the, the triceps. Uh, she's got strong arms. Uh -huh. That's what I'm talking uh -huh. about, yep. folks. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle doth not go out by night. She's a prepper. She's prepped for the worst <laughs> situations. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She's a, a craftsperson. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth uh, her hands to the needy. Again, this sort of providing thing, not just for her family, but for the community. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. 
I'm really not sure what the biblical reference uh, to scarlet. Maybe it's red so it keeps you warm in the snow or something, but still sounds good. Mm -hmm. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Ooh la la. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Again, entrepreneur. Um... And I just hit a button, as I always do. Strength strength and honor are her clothing, and she re shall rejoice in time to come. Again, with the strength and honor. These are things that, uh, you know, I don't think is n necessarily the normal characterization of women in, in our in secular society. Well... Maybe now, but at least the worst parts of secular society, strength and honor, were not, you know, those are sort of like you think of a knight or you think of a soldier or something. Mm -hmm. And when you think of those things, you generally think of men. That's society, folks. That's not the Bible. <laughs> this is the Bible. 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. So she's wise. And her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Amen. Mm -hmm. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Uh, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own work praise her in the gates. So it also ends with this you know, uh, this this ending, which is like, hey, she also, you know, is an individual, a competent, strong individual who, who deserves praise for how cool and strong she is. Um, you know, and you, you can hear a lot of critiques of, uh, you know, Christian ideas of women, and they usually revolve around like, oh, the woman, you know, is, gains all of her... Uh, status from the man and is nothing without a husband and you know is meek and you know just, depending on what century you're in uh was not wise but uh, right here in proverbs this this woman is a uh, mean serious business this is a woman that i think you know the modern feminists would wouldn't mind uh, sort of modeling after yeah absolutely and it's you know the it's it's a wonderful picture of sounds like a matriarch to me yeah Chris. for sure and it is it is a wonderful picture of god's uh idea of what womanhood looks like and uh there's there's so much there you know this sort of uh an independent sort of spirit and that is not to say is she has a husband here uh you know so it's not that she doesn't have need for a man that she doesn't want the company of a man but she uh you know is she can she can function on her own as well She's she may a not value be value generating machine is what yes, she is she... she runs like three different businesses in in proverbs yeah providing for her family on um, the grind in the ancient world, I mean, there was not quite the same sort of luxury as we might have um, kind of in the modern world where you could get away with not working. I mean, in the ancient world, everybody, everybody worked, you know, Had the husband worked, the wife worked, the kids, as soon as they were old enough to walk and start helping out with stuff, they were putting them to work. Everybody worked. So, yes, the, you know, the idea of you, whatever, if you and think of Proverbs her, lady. She's looking good doing it, wearing that silk of purple. Yeah. Yeah, so it is a very favorable, you know, um, idea of, of women, in it, and it shows them in, I think, all of the all of the different ways that a modern modern day sort of feminist um the, the, the as we kind of described it would they, they wouldn't be able to look at any of this and and disagree with any of it i suppose there may be some parts that you could possibly nitpick and i mean even the fact that she this seems to be a family woman with children and with a husband right, I, and yeah. you could you know on, again on the far sides of feminism say that they wouldn't even want anything to do with that however a, a <laughs> reasonable 
unthinkable sort of idea of what a woman is. I don't know who's gonna. I don't know who's gonna disagree with this. And it is um, a picture that's given to us by God of what a godly and a virtuous woman looks like. So yes, it is. It it, it can't be overlooked. Um, it, it it almost has become trite anymore because it's like the one kind of go to <laughs> passage for. Uh, women, you know, on like Mother's Day and women's retreats mm-hmm. and all of these things, and got to buy a card for my mom for Mother's strong Day. Strong arms, and... strong arms. Don't forget the strong arms, <laughs> ladies. So it's yeah, it is. It's it definitely. Um, it's helpful to consider this. It's helpful to keep this in mind as we're as we're considering um, these different sorts of gender roles in um, in a biblical context. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, I don't know why. I just felt so. It it's just uh, it just gets me fired up. In <laughs> not like that, Chris. It gets me fired up <laughs> when I hear, you know, the characterizations of the Christian ideas of women or femininity. And it's, you know, again, unfortunately, not that Christianity is innocent of of many of the things and I'm talking about sort of over the span of history certainly Christianity is not innocent um, of you know propagating honestly contrary ideas of women than what the Bible is is expressing here and that is something that sort of the church as a whole needs to reckon with and do their best with Um, and when I say the church and Christianity in that context I'm including all different varieties, including, you know, the Catholic Church and things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, that's it's one of those things that uh, if only there was more conversation with people who were ready to have sort of the honest and open conversations that are needed. Because all it takes is just reading this to somebody who thinks that, uh, you know, a Christian doesn't uh, expect a woman to be self-sufficient and independent and strong arms. Did I mention the strong arms? You have, yeah, you have okay, mentioned okay. that. Um, <laughs> and so, actually, I've had a, a conversation or two um, with, you know, modern feminists, certainly not the bra-burning types, but uh, those who oftentimes you know you meet somebody and then there's the types that get immediately triggered when they find out you're christian and want to get into all sorts of conversations um and they just simply don't know about this they just have never seen it never heard it in their arguments and battles with other christians they had never had it brought up um and yeah there you go yeah well this is you know it is uh proverbs 31 is just kind of Uh, a little bit of a further commentary on the idea that the Bible has already kind of painted around women and and their the way that they are regarded uh and while people may think and when we talked in the last episode about patriarchy and i made made a case for male headship and while you may think if you have this male headship that's presented so clearly in the bible then what that means is a woman becomes a second class sort of citizen it is it is not the case and hopefully that all became became crystal clear in the last episode but you know you don't have to look far in the text of scripture uh, to see that women have this very prominent place uh, throughout the the narrative of the text and it starts right there in the garden and we were talking about that passage in first timothy which we're going to actually come back to here because i didn't get to the very last last verse um of that passage so we're going to get to that but we'll we'll start in genesis because that's where paul goes back to but Paul says, and when he's writing to Timothy, he says that, you know, it was man was created first and then woman, and it was woman who was deceived, right? So he's, it's like he's, it's like he's putting the blame and putting the responsibility uh, for sin entering the world, basically, through woman. But what's very interesting is that in uh, God's resolution of, you know, what happened there at the garden and in handing out the different curses, he's, he gives that uh, the, the proto-evangelion, the first gospel, the, the prophecy of Messiah, 
to the serpent when he's talking about the curse that uh, falls onto the serpent. And he says, Cursed will you be above all livestock and the wild animals. This is uh, Genesis uh, 3, uh, 14. Um, and you will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And then in 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So what God is saying, like, in, in this proclamation here, is that while, yes, as, as Paul rightly you have to agree with Paul. <laughs> you have to agree with what he's saying. He he rightly points out, yes, it was Eve that was deceived, but also, and, and he's not leaving this out, we're, we're going to get to this in, in what Paul writes, but it was, it's also woman through whom the reconciliation for this curse will come. And, and this is what God is saying. Like this woman that you deceive, talking to the serpent, it is actually through her that you're destruction is going to come. And God is already putting woman in this place above the serpent through which he is going to provide his means of salvation and his means to correct this curse. Now, that's going to come through the person of Jesus uh, for certain, um, and we, we don't want to get into the into the place uh, where, you know, some of our Catholic, uh, you know, brothers and sisters might get where we where we put uh, Mary too high on this scale. But she certainly is to be honored and she is to be respected um, for her role in, in, in the way that God chose her to, you know, be the be the mother of Jesus. Mm-hmm. However, she's been given this place of prominence from the very beginning, that it's going to be through her that this curse is broken. And now if you fast forward back to this First Timothy passage, which we didn't get to, but as Paul is giving this commentary on this situation, and he talks about women being quiet and, and in submission and not, you know, asserting authority over men, and then he gives this, this little explication in, in 1 Timothy 2, and starting in verse 13, for Adam was formed first and then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived, it was woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Verse 15, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith love and holiness with propriety. Now, most people, when they read this passage, it's it's very uh, interesting to, to kind of consider what's going on here and what Paul is talking about. And most people, because he's making this allusion to uh, the garden here, it's very easy to go back to that promise that was made, or the curse rather, that was made to Satan, uh, to the serpent, that you know, it's going to be through the woman that his destruction is going to come. And it seems that when he's talking about women being saved through childbearing, that that is actually spiritual salvation that is going to come through childbearing, which is something that is done by the woman. And that may very well be the case. When I wrote a paper on this um, in one of my seminars, uh, we were, I was studying the, the Artemis uh, kind of cult there, and one of the bits that I didn't get to with the, you know, worship of Artemis, and especially in that uh, Hellenistic culture there in Ephesus, is that women who were, you know, Hellenistic and pagan and those sorts of things and worship the Pantheon, while they were giving birth, they would uh, cry out to uh, Artemis while they were giving birth because there was a very high uh, mortality rate back in back in those days I mean in pretty much all before the modern era it was almost like a almost like a coin flip as to you know whether or not a woman was going to survive uh, childbearing and it was this thing where again these women these Christian women looking at these priestesses of Artemis and kind of you know modeling their lives after them another one of the things that they may have been doing that the priestesses of Artemis did was when they became pregnant calling out to Artemis in the midst of their childbearing uh, in order to be saved. And it could be also that what Paul is doing here is he's saying that you're going to be saved not through Artemis. It's not going to be this this false god who saves you in the midst of your childbearing, but it is going to be the one true god should you continue um, in faith, love, and holiness. And that's another way that that can be read, but most commentators are going to kind of gravitate more towards that understanding that women are being saved because they are perpetually in that act of 
giving birth to a new generation, a godly offspring who, hopefully, uh, every one of us who are, are rearing children, every one of us who are Christians are rearing children who are going to fight the good fight of faith and who are also going to continue to tread on, you know, serpents um, all around them. So, that just right at the beginning is another example where women are not being, they're not second class citizens. They're doing very incredible things. And that's right at the beginning of the book. Wow. Sounds thorough. Yeah. Well, I mean, kind of. I mean, that that's just the start. And then you and then you move through and then you start to see the way that all of these, you know, women operate in the in the women in the Bible. They don't play small roles. Um, they, they play very important and kind of uh, distinct roles in the narrative. It's funny because I was um, many, many moons ago, I don't know how old I was, but um, it was back in the day when you, you lived at home and just had to watch whatever your mom, you know, put on the TV or whatever uh, for the evening. And at some point we were watching my big fat Greek wedding. Um, do you remember that one? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Windex. Something with Windex, That's, for sure. I was going to say, the only two things I remember from my big fat Greek wedding are uh, Windex is uh, a home remedy for acne. Um, mm-hmm. And turns out I was fortunate enough that I uh, never had to deal with acne pretty much ever in my life. Every once in a while, I would get a pimple or something and uh, got one at just an inopportune time. And I remembered in my big fat Greek wedding uh, that if you put Windex on a pimple, it'll dry the thing up. I guess it's the ammonia in the Windex or whatever. Who knew? But I did it before I went to bed one night, woke up the next morning, pimple was gone. Uh, incredible. So there you go. Little oh little, little life hack for all of you out You're there. You're a scientist. Yeah. Um, you needed to figure out for yourself. It, well, it worked. So Windex on, on a pimple will dry it up pretty quickly. But the other... The only other thing I remember from my big fat Greek wedding, and honestly, I remember no other things, was there was this one instance where this, you know, the the leading lady in it is this Greek woman, and she, you know, finds this American man she wants to marry and whatever, and her family very Greek, and she's there talking to her mother about, you know, the dynamics of the marriage relationship, and... Her mom says, she makes this comment, and she says, the man is is the head of the home. And she says, but the woman is the neck that turns the head. Um, and I always remembered mm. that, and I thought that that was this really, you know, kind of interesting, interesting take on it. But when you look through, you know, the text of Scripture, and you look through these different stories, you see that that kind of is uh, the case in a lot of these different stories. And whether that be for better or worse, you know, you can find all different kinds of instances, but you will have this kind of leading, if you will, male character who, you know, kind of the story is more or less about, but then there is this relationship with this woman that strongly begins to influence uh, his decisions, um, the way that he's acting, how he's behaving and all of these things. And it is almost like there's a certain amount of control, like this certain amount of sway that women have over men. And it can be used in a positive way. It can be used if it is a woman who follows after the model in Proverbs 31, whose heart and mind is set on God, then she is going to be continually turning her husband's head, turning his heart and his mind towards the things of God. And that is a incredible and awesome responsibility for women to have is to is to be directing your husband his 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 mind his thoughts all of those different things or um it could be it could go in the other direction and unfortunately in the bible a good majority of the cases that we see in the bible are the women kind of using their their influence in sort of a negative way but you also have to remember that all of the lead male characters in the Bible are also <laughs> terrible. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, there's not one uh, character in the Bible like save Jesus. Right. That, uh, you know, a human, a purely uh, human man that uh, has an impeccable record. Yeah, but Job, maybe, you know, you, you Perhaps, could make the yes. argument, you could make the argument for Job. Uh, but aside from that, and the dynamic between Job and his wife is actually really... It's really interesting. We'll maybe come back to that um, in just a second. But yes, 
uh, it, just because sometimes the women are using that influence in, in kind of a negative way to kind of steer things in a way that might not be glorifying to God, you see that with the men too. Um, but mm -hmm. you do have, you know, positive examples too of, of women. And there are, you know, these many instances where these different, you know, what I've, I can try to go through and think of them, didn't make a list of these things, but you have like, of course, Samson and Delilah, and you see the whole way that Delilah, you know, kind of manipulates and and turns him to to do you know this particular thing that is against god you have of course like jezebel and ahab another terrible example those are maybe the two worst women in the bible that i just started with there so bear with me <laughs> as we go through but um you have even like um moses and and his wife when they are leaving and they're going back into back into egypt and he has not yet circumcised his sons and she is the one who actually gets up in the middle of the night and circumcises his sons because God is basically going to kill all of them because Moses hasn't done this thing that God has commanded. So she steps in, intercedes on behalf of her family there. Um, in that moment, you have uh, very notably Pilate, you know, and his wife. And as he's kind of deliberating over what to do with Jesus, you know, his wife comes and says, I had a dream and you better not, you better stay out of this situation with this guy. And Pilate seems to, you know, take the advice of his wife as she has given him this advice to, to wash your hands of this guy and be done with this thing because you do not want to be a part of this. And I think about those sorts of things and I mean, in my own, you know, <laughs> relationship, in my marriage with my wife, it, it's the same sort of thing. You know, I'm not standing around all the time telling my wife what to do and telling her where we're going and how it's going to be and all of that. But I'm looking to her for, you know, I don't very often, I don't know what to do in a situation, you know, especially right. with this new church stuff. It's like, I don't really, what do you think we should do? I don't really know. And I, I'm going to her for wisdom. I'm going to her to help steer the ship and to help guide our home and all of those things. So while I find myself in this position of leadership, it is not to leave her behind and say, hey, follow me and I'm going to make the decisions and you just get on board with it. But we're, we're you know, trying to partner in uh, moving forward in all of these things. And I do the best that I can. You know, I, I have a propensity to kind of act independently of everyone in my life I can kind of you know isolate myself in a lot of ways and become very introspective and those sorts of things so I have to be very intentional about it in a lot of ways but I know that I can always go to her and I can seek her advice and ask her and I know that she's going to be pointing me back to God and pointing me back to those sorts of things so that is you know another way in which you see throughout the Bible that there are these sorts of roles that these women play while maybe you're not the leader the person at, at the front here but that doesn't mean that your role is uh, not very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay, nailed it. You got a good neck over there. Don't forget that. <laughs> it's like um, a tower from... It's like a tower. I forget <laughs> where. <laughs> from it was. Song of... Gilead Solomon? or something. Song, song yeah, of something. Yeah, Song of Solomon, yeah. Um, so, okay. I... I feel compelled to bring up at some point we got to bring up Deborah because uh -huh. we mentioned Deborah in patriarchy. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I mean, if we're talking biblical matriarchy, Deborah is like the biblical matriarch. Yes. I mean, as far as like politically in Israel. Yes. With Deborah, you have in the time of the judges, uh, God would appoint as needed a person, a leader uh, behind whom the nation could rally uh, in in almost every instance to go and defeat uh, whoever their enemies happened to be at that time. They were generally uh, some kind of war strategist or, you know, leader or something like that. And all through all of these, uh, you know, Samson, um, Ehud, and uh, who's, who's the other one? Uh, Gideon. Um and the, the, several other it's all these it's all these war exploits with deborah again you have the the fact that god initially calls barak and he asks him to do this thing and he wimps out he he does not do you know the thing that god has called him where you have even like with gideon like god calls gideon and gideon 
definitely doesn't want to do it. He's scared. He's trying to make all these different excuses. He's asking God for signs. Like he's he doesn't want to do it. But in the end, he ends up doing it. It's not the same with Barack. Barack doesn't want to do it, says, I'm not going to do it, refuses to go. And then there is this woman who is there who is, uh, you know, a, a faithful servant of the Lord and who God knows is a woman who is after his heart and a woman who is going to be obedient. And he says, if you're not going to do it, strong arms, strong arms, (laughs) arms. Deborah was a warrior. Then if, if you're not going to do it, then I know somebody who will. And yes, I, I said in, in the episode about patriarchy, I called it a punishment. I don't, it, in, in a sense, in a sense, I think it is, it might be too strong a word, but it, as we discussed, as you were, were asking about, it is, it was a social embarrassment is, is what it was that instead of you doing this, I've taken a woman now to, to lead this nation into battle because you wouldn't do it. And that's essentially what it was. And I cited the, you know, the text out of Isaiah where God basically says as much that when you have children and women leading you, this is not a good sign. And God says that in Isaiah and that's what's going on here in Judges. So yes, she is there and she is ready to fill that role that a man defaulted in. But the first, (laughs) God's first choice in that was a man. And we got to talking about this too last week when we were talking about the church, that there are so many times that women are the ones who seem to be holding everything together, that women are the ones who are serving, that women are the ones who are showing up. And I can tell you now, kind of as a new pastor, the uh, congregation who is at the church there already, it is, that's the way that it is. Women are the ones yeah. faithfully showing up to everything. They're the ones, you know, needing to know what needs to be done. Um, there are men there who are who are also helping and doing those sorts of things. But more consistently, it seems to be the women who are available and who are ready to, you know, serve at, at a moment's notice. However, <laughs> that doesn't alleviate the men from the fact that it is their responsibility to to be doing those things first. And not to say that we don't need the help of the women. We certainly do. But they should be the ones who are first stepping up and saying, I will do this. I will serve the Lord. I will follow him. And when the men uh, sit back on their butts and don't do anything, then you have women stepping up. And I believe that that is what is happening uh, with the instance of Deborah. That's not to say like she's she wasn't wrong in what she was doing. Praise God for her. God looked and said, this is a faithful person who will do what I have called. But it is indisputable that it was plan B. <laughs> so mm. while, of course, God's infinite, you know, or knowledge least, about or everything. Or at least, yeah, it was plan A and God wanted to make a point. And yes, and to, yes, yes, that is probably a better way to put it, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, from what we know about Deborah and her story there, she nailed it. She nailed she it. Did. Judges 5 has the song of Deborah, which is... Uh, Pretty much just talks about how much she nailed it. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't have done, Barack couldn't have done any better. No, no, he couldn't. And this is one of the things, too, that's really interesting when you talk about, when we talk about kind of gender roles and complementarianism and egalitarianism. And um, people like to cite Galatians 3. And and in Galatians 3, in verse 28, Paul uh, is talking... And well, starting in verse 26, just to kind of get get the, the bigger picture here, he says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you uh, who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. So, people like to cite this verse to say that, see, they say, see, there is no distinction between Jews and Gentiles, and there is no distinction between slave and free, and there is no distinction between male and female. And on the surface, that is seems like that is what Paul is saying. But 
Paul here is actually, if you know about the letter to the Galatians, you know that what Paul is doing is he's combating uh, the Judaizers who are there in Galatia. There's this new church, uh, Galatians, almost certainly the first book uh, that was written in the New Testament, uh, written by Paul sometime around 48, 49, um, the first writing that we have in the canon of the New Testament, um, the first thing that Paul ever wrote, and he is writing to this new church in Galatia, who he went there to preach the gospel, and then these Judaizers came in, and they said, yes, 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 this stuff about Jesus, but you need Jesus plus, and they were trying to keep people in obedience to uh, the, you know, observation of Jewish law, circumcision, uh, being chief among those sorts of things, and then, you know, keeping the law. So they are in there trying to Judaize these people, turn these people into Jews. And, you know, they would say Christians at the same time, yes, believe in Jesus, but also you can't forsake, you know, Torah law. Part of uh, some of this Jewish tradition that you had was there was a prayer that was prayed by um, Jewish men um, in those days, and I believe it's recorded in the Talmud or the Mishnah, one of these, I think we have a recording of it, but th- the prayer would go, th- a Jewish man would wake up and he would say to God every day in the morning, God, I thank you that I was not born a Gentile or a slave or a woman. And this is the prayer that the Jewish man would say to God every morning. He would give this prayer of thanks, and he would say, thank you that I'm not a Gentile or a slave or a woman. Mm. So Paul, when he's writing here and he's combating this Judaism, he's combating these sorts of Jewish traditions, certainly one of the things that would have been taught to these people through these Judaizers is this prayer. Thank you that I was not born a Gentile or a slave or a woman. And what Paul is saying, it's not, he's not dispelling with Jew and Gentile or slave and free or male and female. He's certainly not doing that. What he's saying is this Jewish tradition, this way of seeing the world through this lens is done away. That's really the argument that he's making here. He's saying we're all children of God. In us all being children of God, there is equality at the foot of the cross, but that does not do away with the distinctions that we have here. And we know that for certain because, again, this is the first letter that Paul wrote, and he's going to go on and write several other letters where he's going to make distinctions between Jews and Gentiles and slave and free and male and female. So this is one of those verses that people sometimes like to go to, and they like to say, well, there's no, there is, you know, men and women, they're they're just the same. And no, men and women are unique, and that is very special. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't settle for us being the same. That that shouldn't be something that we're looking at. Um, in in I I think it's I feel so badly when it's like women are looking at men and maybe the roles that men have and and the parts that they play and they're thinking like that they they want that like they they want that sort of thing for themselves that maybe is not supposed to be theirs. And that can be anybody, you can take what I just said and get really upset about it if you fill in the blank with one thing, or you can understand where I'm coming from and, and agree that yes, we should we should be content with the lot that the Lord has given us and be very happy with it and understand that he's, he's given generously to all of us. Um, so yeah, I I just get it's it's sad that there's this sort of idolization over, you know, the other all the time. It does seem to be sort of a trend, doesn't it? It just seems to be how humans tr- the direction we trend in is looking for uh that sort of categorization. Yeah. Um I do want to make a a quick clarification. Okay. For those who may be, um, and I should have jumped in earlier. I did not know that there was a, uh, such an, a, a, an excellent um, teaching coming immediately after. But in the story of Deborah, I think it's interesting uh, to note that Deborah was you know, a prophetess and the judge, the, the leading Israel at the time. And she was the one that told Barak hey, God wants you to, to go to battle now. And Barak said to Deborah, 
Unless you uh, go with me. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I'll go, but you got to come with me if we're going to go. Yeah. Which which is kind of funny. I mean, yeah. Especially knowing the sort of, uh, you know, cultural norms where, you know, you got Barack, this big warrior man, being told that it's time to go to battle. And he's like, well, well De- can Deborah come with me? I'm not going unless Deborah goes. Yeah. And then uh, Deborah agrees, said, yeah, okay, I'll go. But and then basically calls him a wimp like, but the honor will not be yours. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with you if you want. But uh, it's just you're a real, uh, real coward boy here. Yeah. And as it uh, should be that and that goes back to too, the the, you know, little for instance that I gave in the last episode where, you know, you hear a bump in the night and you send your wife out there. I mean, it's like, come on, give me a break. Or if you say, will you come with me? It's like, no, you <laughs> Go, you yeah, go. Yeah, you hear someone breaking into your house. Babe, <laughs> you babe, babe. Someone's breaking I'm in. Sc- I'm scared. Come with me. <laughs> I only have one bat, though, so you take it. I'll be right behind you. <laughs> it's. I mean, it's. It and that's that's one of the things. It's like people get you know. I I can I can see a certain you know group of people a uh, particular demographic or or you know worldview listening to this conversation not that they would be but should they listen to it becoming you know very offended and upset about these things but it's like there are these sorts of intrinsic ideas that we all have inside of us you know and it's like I mean this the idea of chivalry you know and whether or not that should you know that should continue to exist but you know i still haven't and it's probably happened but i haven't seen any women you know proposing to men um or or anything like that you know we understand that in these in these positions of you know leadership that 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 is that is one of the things it's taking initiative that you're the one taking, you know, the initiative to start this new family and and to ask this woman to be your wife and those sorts of things. And it that sort of gets me to thinking about this, you know, kind of this pushback that I've seen and, and heard people talking about that's kind of come into, I guess, maybe like pop culture or whatever, um, where we have these new sorts of female heroines, um, mm-hmm. which is which is another thing that I'm that I'm like actually all four you know um you've had for a long time the sort of trope of the like sort of damsel in distress and that sort of like disney princess sort of thing where there's like this picture of just this woman who's sitting around and just things aren't right in her life and she just wants more and needs more and whatever it is you know fill in the blank for all of these disney princesses and then she's just waiting for this man to come along this man to come into her life who's going to make everything going to make everything right and this is another one of the things that the sort of feminist movement pushes against and it's one of the things that i can agree with them on that like this is not the story that we should be telling young girls like right. you're you know you're uncomfortable and and your life's not where where you you need it to be and you're you're there's something else that you want in your life and you're just waiting for some man to come along and fix it all because th- First of all, life is not a fairy tale, and the man who comes along into your life is almost certainly going to make it worse, not better. <laughs> He's going to complicate it somehow. Something's going to go wrong, and it's going to become more complicated. Uh, you're not going to live happily ever after. But also, there is that sense, you know, when they talk about this in Christian dating and all of this stuff all the time, that you don't need to be thinking about getting into a relationship with another person unless you are whole and satisfied in yourself, in who you are all on your own and this you know for for women just the same as it is for men and this is you know what i say to to the women out there is it's like no no man at least no human man is going to bring fullness and satisfaction to your life you need to be complete in who you are before you start pursuing or even entertaining the idea of some other man coming into your life. And of course, as a Christian, I believe the only way that you can feel complete in who you are is through a relationship with Jesus. And until you have that fullness in and of yourself, uh, then then no, like there is no fairy tale Disney story of Prince Charming who's going to come in and make your life better. And that's one of the reasons that I kind of, you know, I like kind of the the turn that some of these, 
you know, Disney movies are taking where like anymore, it's like these girls are the leading characters and they're the ones going out and they don't need, they don't need some dude to make their lives happy and complete. Maybe they meet some guy along the way and, and you know, maybe that's cool, but they're, they're showing them to have this initiative. They're showing them to have this ambition, this courage, all of these different things. And I think it's really beautiful and wonderful. And it seems like that kind of Proverbs 31 sort of woman uh, now being brought to the forefront, even in some of the, you know, fairy tale Disney sorts of movies that we're seeing. So I think that's yeah. really cool, actually. Isn't it funny how, you know, Disney... Disney, and we say Disney, but it really just encompasses all of culture yeah. during those time, that time frame. Uh, you know, Disney puts out all these movies that, uh, you know, feminists think are problematic and have all these critiques with. And, uh, you know, this is sickening how culture is placing women in these roles and oh, the patriarchy and all oh, religion. And then Disney starts making movies that have like women with biblical traits, like the <laughs> biblical traits for a good woman. And the feminists love it. And it's yeah. great. We all love it. I mean, it just shows. Uh, and the th again, I'll say it again. This is the thing that frustrates me is that they just don't know it. Like if they just knew like, oh, yeah, with this new wave of culture with these uh, strong women characters with uh, entrepreneurs and strong arms uh, <laughs> is actually a reflection of ancient descriptions of how women should be. Uh, things would ju I just feel like everybody would get along a little bit better. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that is, that's kind of the secular view of the Bible in a nutshell. I mean, everything... It's like there's some sort of propaganda that uh, says that Christians think of women one way when it's literally the opposite. You mean like the devil would come in and try to deceive the entire world into thinking uh, what the Bible know, is? <laughs> that is ringing a bell, Chris. That is ringing a bell. Yeah. Man, he's so crafty that way, isn't he? But it's not It's not even just feminism. It's everything. You know, it's, it's right. whatever, yeah. slavery and racism and totally. you know, misogyny and mistreatment of the poor and all these things. It's like they get... They get lumped into this modern day sort of evangelical view of the world and like And it really is just the American brand, the the sort of corporatized uh, American brand of evangelicalism that gets the bad rap. And uh, of course we've gone through the history of the sort of uh, ideological invasion of American evangelicals by, you know, certain power centers that wanted to use it for other means. Um, and, you know, it seems like we've been in a battle to break out of that ever since, or at least those who are aware of that deception. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I think it's a, a battle we can all get behind, trying to straighten things out. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, unfortunately, there are for instances, and this is one of the reasons, I mean, you know, stereotypes or whatever exist for a reason. Stereotypes are there for a reason. Painting with broad brushes uh, sometimes is not entirely unjustified. And I look at the church, and even as we have talked about, you know, in in men's dereliction of their responsibilities in areas of leadership or servanthood in the church, um, I've also seen... You know, sadly, in the church, I've seen men with a misunderstanding of what their leadership looks like. And I have seen men who treat and talk to their wives as though they are lesser than and jokingly reference, you know, <laughs> Paul being like, you, you need to submit. You need to be in submission. Ha <laughs> ha. And, you know, kind of laughing about it or whatever. But knowing, you know, you're knowing you're not really... You, you really mean what you're saying and it's yeah. and it's kind of sad and really kind of disgusting and then of course you're obviously not you know understanding the full counsel of scripture there anyway so uh, while some of these things are 
yes, they're like misguided understandings of the Bible. It's not that some people aren't justified in having these ideas because they've they've seen this played out in the church and they've maybe even experienced it before. And to all, you know, the women who are out there who, I don't know, maybe are in that sort of a relationship right now or have witnessed it or have come out of it, you know, my heart breaks to see... Um, that going on in the church and especially it being done under the guise of some kind of biblical truth or something like that. And, you know, it is, it is, again, (laughs) in in my understanding of, of male headship and of male leadership, that needs to be a life of service and sacrifice to those people who are in your purview of responsibility, chief among those, your wife and your children. And then of course, uh, the church that you should be serving. And, um, you know, I just, for the women who are out there who may be in that sort of situation, um, I'm praying for you and, um, I'm sorry and keep on, you know, uh, serving the Lord faithfully and living your life, uh, of submission and sacrifice unto him. And, uh, you know, he will reward you for that and he will uh, lift your head up. That's nice, Chris. I got another idea. (laughs) All right, ladies. (laughs) Turn that podcast up. Turn up your, take your earbuds out. Put that sucker on speakerphone. Attach it to the Bluetooth speaker <laughs> in the living room. Oh okay, boy! I'll give you, I'll give you a second. Okay, there you go. You know how to do it. It's you, you just go to settings, go to Bluetooth, tap on the speaker, the one that says "Daddy's Living Room Boombox." <laughs> click, click on that. Right. If you're in a situation like Chris was describing, I'll help you out here. Okay, here we go. We good? We on? Okay. Hey, hey, pal. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, buddy, you think you're a big, tough man, don't you? Now listen up. Wait, hold on. Listen up, <laughs> man. It's me, a big, strong man. And you got to listen to me because you're a lady. You're strong big strong armed lady who can till the fields and dresses in that purple silk and gets up while it's still light and provides food for the family while you're snoring like a like a hemi with a loose carburetor you listen up that lady is a treasure she's more valuable than rubies you need to read your bible sir (laughs) <laughs> Open it up. Proverbs 31, 10. Read it. Think about it. Then go listen to Ravel Podcast, the patriarchy episode. You think you're a big, strong leader, man? Well, listen to God, my friend. You are a servant. You may be the head, brother, but she's the neck. So get your act together. All right. God bless you, brother. Talk to you next time. Oh boy! There you go. We have really come my, into our own here, haven't we? As my contribution <laughs> to the ladies of our listenership who just may need just a, you know a little little something. That is my offering as a oh. as a biblical man to help <laughs> straighten out that layabout you got Thank walking you. around there. I will. You I will say that. Um... <laughs> First of all, thank you for that. That was beautiful. Mm-hmm. You're um, welcome. Well, it wasn't for you, but okay. <laughs> but I get it. I get it, Chris. As a man, you think that everything I do is for you, but it's okay. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> I, my my dear, sweet aunt, um, she uh, was in, is in a marriage, um, and for the longest time, my uncle, uh, her still husband, and uh, they have four children together, my four cousins, whom I love very dearly, one of my favorite families um, on the planet. And for a long time, he was an alcoholic, and he was into uh, different, I think he was using some kinds of drugs or something like that. And uh, he just mistreated her. Not, I don't think he was, I don't think he was ever physically abusive. I never heard of anything like that. Probably would have known not to her or to the kids, but he was just a jerk and he was just inconsiderate. And he, 
you know, was he was dealing with a lot. He was dealing with a lot of past pain and those sorts of things and was dealing with it in the wrong way. And my aunt, she just prayed faithfully for, you know, for years for him. And, you know, of course, she's, she, it's not, like I said, he's not being physically abusive. She's not in a dangerous situation. I'm not setting this as a model for every, for every situation. So please don't take it sure. this way. But, yeah. um, just telling a story. Yeah. She prayed faithfully for him, uh, year after year after year that God would open his eyes and God would capture his heart. And over time, lo and behold, he, as, as the Bible says that through her faithful, uh, witness and testimony, she turned his heart and his mind uh, to God. And he now is, you know, one, I mean, he always was really funny and kind of fun to be around, but he's even more so now. He's the sweetest, kindest man, uh, you know, that I know, one of the sweetest, kindest men that I know. I know a lot of sweet, kind men, but he's, he's just this wonderful man now. They have this beautiful marriage, and it was because, you know, kind of like we said, her, her being the neck, and even though he was a big old heavy head, you know, she, she stayed in there faithfully and, and prayed for him. And now she, you know, in many ways was, she was the leader of that home for a while as he was defaulting in it. She was the one taking the kids to church. She was the one pointing the kids to Jesus. She was the one doing all of the parenting and all of those things. And almost, she wasn't happy about it. She wasn't excited that she was doing all of those things. But over time, you know, in, in acting in that role, she brought him around to the things of the Lord. And now it's just a beautiful picture. And for some reason, I just felt, I just felt compelled, um, to share that. So, uh, yeah, that's great. And yeah, you know, that, that's a wonderful, um, a wonderful telling of just how life can be, uh, in so many different ways. Now I will say, uh, she is a godly woman who had faith and, uh, uh, the Lord heard her prayers, uh, but perhaps it wouldn't have taken so long if there was some podcaster that she knew, <laughs> um, who, you know, just was really direct and maybe made some sort of audio product available, um, that could be blasted throughout the house. Oh man, we could just play that Mark Driscoll, uh, sermon for everybody. How dare you! I don't know which Mark Driscoll, Driscoll sermon you're talking about. Who in the hell do you think you are? I'm talking about me, Chris. Who do you think you are? Don't talk about Mark Crystal. (laughs) It is a wonderful service uh, that you provide for the church. Um, So I do. It's just part of my ministry. You are not God. You are just a man. You're not an impressive man. You're not a responsible man. You're not a noble man. I could do uh, personalized ones, too, if anybody needs one. Let me know. Send me an email. Yeah. Maybe maybe that'll be our monetization structure. You're not a responsible man in any regard. I don't care how successful you are. Instead of, uh, you know, getting some sort of underwriter or getting a PayPal account or something, I'll just sell personalized beratement tracks. <laughs> in this area, <laughs> if you are a failure, it clouds all of your dignity it robs all of your masculinity wives to play loudly <laughs> to their husbands oh man there is no excuse for any man who claims the name of christ to treat a woman in a dishonorable disrespectful way you know the internet is a wonderful place all sorts of ways to support oneself oh uh, well i um, don't know where this is going or how to wrap I do. it up <laughs> i do we're not quite ready to wrap oh, up okay yet. i it, i know it feels that way and we probably should if we were smart we probably <laughs> would but there is we left this cliffhanger from last episode that we did not uh bring up Mr. Chris, mm-hmm. and that is El Shaddai. Oh, yeah. Yes. We did not really breach the topic of any sort of, um, you know, uh, femininity that may be expressed yes. in a Thank sort you. of matriarchal uh, position of God the Father, uh-huh. which, as we understand from last episode, is very explicit. Uh, you know, that uh, God is referred to in male terms. That doesn't necessarily mean that he is a, a sort of, you know, m- male 
entity like a male DNA expression or whatever. I know some that'll make some people uncomfortable. Except, except for Jesus. <laughs> Very yeah, I'm talking about the Father. Yeah. Talking about the Father. Right. Yes, we know. But you know, without human DNA, it's hard to sort of grasp the idea of of you know gender expressions as the kids are saying today um but uh you uh, for once for once when we ended the recording on the patriarchy episode we ended the recording and having a little chat after the show and for once in the history of ravel i that's right i basil podcaster taught Dr. Christopher Ryan Gates something. Now, let me jump in just real quick and say it Don't wasn't... Don't take this from me, <laughs> Dr. Chris. It, I'm not. I'm actually expanding okay. it. Oh, good. Uh, in, the, in the last episode, you were so kind as to say, you know, that you were always learning something as we were talking. And I said, you know, thank you. And I repaid you with the same compliment and said that I, too, I always am, am learning from you. And that was not just tongue-in-cheek, and I wasn't just yeah. saying it casually. Uh, first of all, expansive vocabulary, always, always pulling out new fun words that... Um, you know, uh, we'll have to double check on, uh, secondly, <laughs> yes. strange. I mean, even just a few episodes ago, the umim and the thumim, I mean, it's recorded live there for all people oh, in yeah. the annals of history for forever. And then yes, El Shaddai as the many breasted one was brand new to me. So this was not something that I was, that I was familiar with, um, until you brought it up. But yes, we had a discussion, very fascinating. And I That's feel like you, you should for fraternizing with uh with a with a charismatic yeah chris well Jesus. i'm very interested to hear about the many-breasted god so go ahead and uh take us through it okay christopher let me learn you something time to learn about <laughs> el shaddai and uh i will start out by making clear that um uh you know there there are rebuttals to this uh Always. idea being expressed so this is by no means a, a sort of mm, un uh what is the word uh it's, it's uncontested uh use of the term in the bible however it is indeed uh a matter of translation and el shaddai uh pops up all over the bible uh first popping up in genesis 17 1 so right there at the beginning uh, also pops up in Genesis 35. Uh, you can read it in Exodus 6, 2 and 3, um, all the way back, uh, all the way over to uh, Numbers, Numbers 24, and it's it's all over the place. And I'll, you'll know why, just being such a learned gentleman as yourself, you'll know why you haven't heard of it, even though it pops up a lot. And uh, but the ed etymology, if you if someone is unaware. El Shaddai is one of the names of God, one of the names of Yahweh. Um, and when you're just reading your English Bible, any Eng most English translations will simply translate El Shaddai uh, as God Almighty. Uh, El, obviously, translation is God or Lord, as is common in the translation game, Chris. Um, but Shaddai is a much more interesting translation. Uh, you know, some scholars, uh, you know, bringing from the root word shadad, meaning to, to overpower or to destroy or something. Some people uh, translate the word uh, or use the root shaid, which is uh, something about a great demon, but we can kind of assume that they're not calling God a demon. Uh, there's, uh, there's some other ones, but one of them, one of the most direct translations of Shaddai is breast. And so the name for God of El Shaddai is commonly, uh, translated or would likely be translated as many breasted one. And in the context of where El Shaddai pops up, which is all over the place, which are English translators, Christopher, <laughs> uh, were uncomfortable with the idea 
of translating El Shaddai, giving the name of God as the, the many-breasted one. Now, in the kind of, you know, the, the more, the spirit of the word, you know, referring to God being a provider, like a, uh, a, a caretaker, a provider, much like a mother would care for her children and provide for them. Um, but there you go, right there in black and white, baby. El Shaddai, the many-breasted one. Now, this has, of course, been used in all sorts of ways uh, for different groups of Christians or offshoots or whatever to try to apply a sort of a, a female gender to God in this way. But as we know, God is uh, is above all these uh, all these categorizations he does not fit in any boxes he's too big he's too male to be male he's too female to be female he is above it all uh christopher but um you know the uh when you talk about matriarchy or the many different aspects of god of course god has many names many of them are very masculine but there is this one that pops up over and over el shaddai the provider um Actually, that's Jehovah Jireh. Sorry, El Shaddai, uh, the many-breasted God. And so, booyah. I don't know where else to take that, but uh, is <laughs> that's something I've known since I was like 13 years old because I thought it was hilarious to see the word breast, uh, you know, in some sort of uh, scriptural reference book or strong's concordance yeah type where of did thing. you which which one of your sunday school teachers taught you this when you were 13 <laughs> honestly this because my parents were pastors there was all sorts of big bo- books around you know the big fancy theology books mm-hmm. i'm almost positive that me as a 13 year old may have looked up some <laughs> in some index <laughs> looking for the word breast in these books and wow. that's where i learned about el shaddai wow yeah, yeah. the the matriarchal uh characteristics of yahweh um again not assigning any gender to the to the the guy the the god um but uh yeah it's that's it's definitely now it's of course connected with um all sorts of ancient agrarian mother goddess worship societies type things like that as well mm-hmm. um but you know there's jesus in the gospels portraying god both as maternal and paternal in in his analogies there are analogies uh used even in the old testament uh i believe it was isaiah 66 or something i think it was mm-hmm. isaiah 66 yep, yep. as a mother comforts her child so will i comfort you and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. El Shaddai is saying that to us, folks. So just keep that in mind. Matriarchs all over the world, um, you know, God is bigger than is comfortably comprehensible by the human mind. And uh, that is (laughs) no better exemplified by the fact that some English translators of the Bible just could not bring themselves to directly translate El Shaddai. <laughs> I am admittedly not uh, prepared to handle this situation uh, in a way that reflects my academic credentials right now. Um, mm-hmm. I am slightly suspect of the uh, direct line of reasoning um, or causation that you might be presenting here. However, as it stands right now, um, I don't, oh, you mean I, calling out those misogynist <laughs> translators? I don't have, I don't have an adequate retort. Um, it's been very busy for me here lately. So yes, as I did <laughs> see this last week when we were recording, and I thought to myself, that's interesting uh, and curious. I stored it away in the back of my mind, where it would be a thing where I would be like, oh yes, I will remember that for next time. Uh, though not prepared to discuss it. So for the time being. Well, I'll give we you. Will... I'll give you an out, also, but it's not going to be great because it's kind of funny. One of the most legit uh, retorts to the El Shaddai many-breasted one, um, Shaddai referring to a mountain or mountains 
instead of breasts. Uh huh. Yeah. But I mean, I think that's. Uh, Is that a, some kind of euphemism? I mean, you've got the Grand Tetons, famous <laughs> oh mountains, and if you know French, you know what that means. Oh God boy, the they're just replacing the word breasts with mountain. Yeah, it's not the most creative uh, way to get out of having to write the many-breasted one. Well. And, apply some sort of matriarchal idea. I will make a commitment to our listeners to do an investigation into this very interesting topic that you have brought up and try to uh, offer some kind of a, at least my take on it, because as of right now, I don't have one. I'm just a Mm -hmm. little bit skeptical. However, I will... Uh, agree with you wholeheartedly that yes there are instances in the scriptures where god does you know assign feminine sort of attributes to himself or speak of himself in a feminine sense you cited the text from isaiah um, 66 i always think about the passage from matthew 23 where jesus is talking he says oh jerusalem jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it how often would i have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings um, and you are not willing so there are these sorts of comparisons um, that you know god makes of himself to mothers whether those be animals or even human mothers um, those those sorts of things and it again was kind of like we were talking about in the last episode where all of these virtues and qualities that women have um, and and hold in themselves strong arms yes the strong arms and those again those sorts of attributes that we generally tend to associate with the females though they are not only those uh but you know the nurturer and and the caretaker and all of those different even just femininity itself whatever that means however one would define it or for a woman out there whatever it means to you to be a woman um that God gave that to you, and it is a part of him that he has given to you. So there is a place somewhere within the Godhead where you can identify and you can find, um, you know, your source in that. So, yes, uh, in in saying that God is, uh, you know, a father and that Jesus was a man, um, and while... uh, the Holy Spirit, it was uh, the the Old Testament Ruach, which is the word that's used for spirit, breath, and wind, is a feminine, although that doesn't necessarily mean that you can use a feminine, you know, uh, noun to refer to things that are, are genderless or whichever, or even that are a different gender. Um, and then the Greek pneuma is actually neutered. Uh, so either way, there's, you know, a little bit of something somewhere maybe there that somebody could say about it. I wouldn't put too much into it. However, what I will say for certain is that the fullness of who every woman is in in her womanhood, she may find the source of that and she may find um, some kind of uh, correspondence in the person of God one way or the other and i would encourage women to you know spend time with the lord and asking him about that and asking him to explain to you what your womanhood means and what your femininity is because i'm certainly not going to be able to tell you because i'm just trying to figure out one woman and it's uh it's not going too bad (laughs) but i'm certainly not there yet so and men listen here read your bibles Read them good and put down the Game Boy. Okay. All right, Chris. Well, I think it's time for us to get a mosey in. You have any last words for the good people? <laughs> Godspeed. Thanks for listening to Ravel. To learn more about who we are, what we believe, or how to support this ministry, visit our website at ravelpodcast.com. If you have a question you would like answered on the show or to let us know how we're doing, email us at contact at ravelpodcast.com. This project is made possible by the prayers and generosity of listeners just like you.
This is a very serious academic podcast, Chris. You gotta take things seriously around here. Oh, I'm trying. I'm trying very hard. How are we ever gonna get the respect we deserve? <laughs>